Revelation chapter 2. As you're turning there, question, what is the most, what is most important to you in your life? What is the number one on your, your priority list? What would you put as number one? Let me ask you this way. If I were to ask your best friend, hey, what's the priority, what's on, on, the, on the, the top of the priority list for so-and-so, what would they say? If I were to ask your parents, what would they say? If your spouse, if I asked your spouse, what would they say? What is most important to you in your life? Jesus is on his way to the cross. And while he's on his way, he's telling stories. He's telling people stories of, of just, just things. And he, they call them parables in Scripture. And he's telling these great stories. And the crowds of people are beginning to, to gather, hundreds and hundreds of people. And he tells in Luke 14, he tells this story of this great wedding. And then he tells the story of this great party. And the crowd is just growing and growing and growing. And in the midst of, this, of, 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 this, of the people, in the midst of that, Jesus takes his focus from the crowd and telling them stories. And he leans over and he speaks to his 12, the 12 he has asked to follow. And he says this, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own mom, well, his own father, his own mother, his own wife, children, brothers and sisters... Yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Like he has this whole large crowd of people, hundreds of people, yet he turns and he speaks to the twelve. And he says this crazy statement. Like what's he talking about? What's he getting at here, Jesus? Jesus. He's emphasizing that discipleship is hard. Discipleship discipleship is difficult. And that in order to to follow him, Jesus says one must hate his own family, his own life, to be his disciple. But Pete, isn't that a sin? Isn't that a a sin to to, to hate? And I say, yes, literally, if you know God's word, it's violation of of the law. So so what's Jesus getting at here? What's What's he trying to do? What's his point? What he's doing is he's stressing that the priority of loving him, how it ought to be above all. One's loyalty to Jesus must come before his parents. One's loyalty to Jesus must come before their kids. It must come before the spouse, must become before his own culture, must become before his own uh, football team. Dave Lucero. (laughs) <laughs> Raiders <laughs> if you guys know Dave every time you have a conversation with him you're, he's, you're eventually going to hear a Raiders you know, even about anything so I love Dave Dave's the man now but in, in, like our loyalty everything everything has to come underneath Jesus so what is most important to you in your life today the second church that we're going to look at in our series of, of the seven churches of Revelation is the church in Ephesus. And the city of Ephesus is located in the western shore of Asia Minor. They are a seaport city. Like trade is all coming to Ephesus through the sea, through this great city, and it becomes this great commercial center. And so Ephesus grows, and there's all sorts of people, and they have two things that they boast about. They boast about the Colosseum, and they boast about the temple that they have there that's a tribute to the pagan goddess that they worship. You see, this goddess that they worship, her name was Artemis. In Latin, she's called Diana. And during the Roman world and and, and the whole Roman society, they had 33 temples there. 33 temples that worshipped Artemis. 
And so Artemis, she was this Olympian goddess of, of hunting. Like she, she was all about childbirth. She focused on protecting younger, younger ladies all the way up to their marriage. And she targeted women and girls. And in, in Ephesus, they had this humongous temple. This, it was so big that it became one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And so with this temple, they would have worship services. This is where the center of this cult worship would take place. It was, it was this mystical cult center. Now, and, and so what, what attracted people to, to worship Artemis was a few things. She promised fertility. She promised long life. She promised protection during pregnancy and childbirth. But what attracted everyone to Artemis, majority of the people, was she promised sexual fulfillment. And so at these temples, at these temples, the worship services that they had weren't like this at all. There wasn't one person teaching or anything. No, the worship service that they would have in these temples were participatory, meaning it was very erotic if you pick up what I'm putting down. Like this, the worship service was, that was what was going on, very sexual all the way around. That was what they worshipped in Ephesus, the goddess of Artemis. And people used it. People used it to, to get rich. People used it to, to, to make a living off of this, and people made money from it. And so understanding that background, that setting, in Acts chapter, 20, in chapter 19 and 20, there's a church that gets planted in the middle of this city. Paul lives with them for some time. He visits them on, his, on the different missions. But when he lives there, he, he corrects their doctrine. He proclaims the gospel, corrects their, the doctrine of truth. He corrects the way of living. He, he gives them the, the real gospel. And over time, what occurs is this church full of people, who, 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 of, of godly men, godly women, who have sound doctrine. This church grows and grows and grows. And in Acts chapter 20, you see later on in, in the chapter, you see the people there, they, they express their love for Paul because he's taken off, he's leaving. And if you ever get a chance to read that, it's, it's, it's so like they're, they're grieving for their pastor. And so Paul leaves, and, and, but he sends them Timothy with a letter, and that's where you get the letter of Ephesians. And he says things like Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 9, he says in it, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, this is a gift of God, not a result of works so that you may boast. The reason why he tells them that is because the worship of Artemis, one of the ways you can gain favor in the goddess of Artemis, Artemis is by works, is by doing stuff, gaining favor by doing stuff. But Paul says here, says here no, for by grace through faith you have been saved. And then it's not your own doing. He said, it's not your own doing, church. It's a gift of God. He tells them that. And then later on in, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 11, remember, knowing the, 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 the city and the, just the background and everything that's going in it, he says this in verse 10 of chapter 6. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now, knowing what's going around, it makes sense what he tells them this, because all of that is happening, and he tells them, stand firm, put on the armor of God, because it's going be, to be hard work. And while there, Timothy, he gets his first and second letter to Timothy, and then later on, Paul does ministry there. And so this church of Ephesus has, has a good um, history of just pastors pouring in, like teaching and equipping, and that's what they do. That, that, that's what they become. They, they become this church that stands against false doctrines. They, they put on the, the belt of truth. It was secured. Their chest plate was on tight. They're, they're on their feet ready to proclaim the gospel, to, to defend it. They held their, their, their shield of faith. Their helmet was, was, was not going anywhere, and they had their sword ready to go. 
That's who this church became. That's who Ephesus became in the midst of, the, of what's going on in, in, in Ephesus. This church flourished. But something happened. Something down the road changed. This, this great church in Ephesus lost her passion. This great church in Ephesus wasn't so hungry anymore. This great church in, uh, in Ephesus, their desire had shifted. This, the, the, the light was a little bit dim. Something changed. Remember last week, Sardis, the first church we looked at? Sardis was known for being the dead church. They wanted to do things for themselves. They, whatever they did was to uphold their name and their reputation, to make them look good. They were focused on themselves, and because they were focused on themselves, it led to them being comfortable, which led to being complacent, which led to them compromising, being in sin. Today, we won't see a dead church. We're going to see a focused church. They're focused They're just focused on the wrong thing. Before we start, let's pray. Jesus, we are about to open up your word. As you speak through John, as you speak to the church in Ephesus, I pray that we interpret it correctly. I pray that we see your, your, your correct Um, interpretation for the church in Ephesus, that we would read it as if we are Ephesus ourselves. But then at at the end of our time, I pray that we can apply apply it correctly. Holy Spirit, this is only done through the power of you in us. And so I pray that this morning that you reveal your desires and the, the, the meaning and everything to us here this morning. We've, said, we've, we've gathered here to, to, with a thousand tongues singing to you how you are certainly enough in our lives and we, we give ourselves away. And so this morning, Holy Spirit, speak to us through your word. Shape us. Cut away the parts that, that, that are not of you, Jesus. And may we leave here this morning challenged, convicted, and with a better understanding of who you are. Jesus, we pray this in your name. Amen. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. John reminds the church in Ephesus, like, who, who is speaking? It is Christ himself speaking. And remember in chapter 1 where it says that the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches? Well, angel could be um, uh, interpreted, or, yeah, interpreted as messenger as well. And so it's like the messengers to the seven churches. And what's interesting is that these messengers, they're not the head of the church. Jesus is still the head of the church. He is sovereign over the messengers. And so as, as he's speaking to these messengers, he's still the one that walks among them, with the, the, among the golden uh, seven uh, lampstands, and he's monitoring the health of these churches. And so just right off the bat, it is Jesus speaking to the churches. Verse 2 says, I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil but have, have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be foes. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not, and you have not grown weary. Jesus begins uh, his, in, in verse 2 and 3 with, with, a, like, with commending the church at Ephesus. He says, man, I, I, I see the work you have done. I know your works. Remember, Jesus knows everything. Like he, he knows everything. He has perfect knowledge. He knows all about truth and everything that every person does and every church does. And so as he says, I know you works, he recognizes two things that they do. First is they are faithful. They are faithful in their living out their life, faithful in their endurance. Verse 2, it says, I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance. And then later on in verse 3, he says, I know you are enduring patiently 
and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Remember the church, the city, the, 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 the city of Ephesus. They're, they're sitting, the church is in the middle of this, this, this sinful city, and so everything, everything you can imagine, just talk about temptation. Talk about temptation. Like here today, we have things on our phones and, and online and, and, you know, pornography and all that stuff and on TV and here. This here in the city, it was right in the open. People were just walking by. So talk about temptation. Yet here, Jesus recognizes them and says, I know your works, your toil, your patient endurance. I know you are enduring, enduring patiently. Like they are, are buckled down. The word for toil or works, whatever the uh, translation you have, is kopos. It means to labor to the point of sweat and exhaustion. It means to, to labor to the point of weariness. It, it, it means to work so hard that your mind and muscle just, at the end of the day, you just want to sleep. Jesus here tells them, I, I see you. I see your great effort. They're not the kind of Christians here in Ephesus. They weren't the kind of Christians that wanted box seats. They weren't the kind of Christians that, 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 that would, you know, wanted certain coffee. They, 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 they weren't the kind of Christians that wanted to be entertained. No, they were, they were involved. They came and taught. They, they, they shared Christ. They would plant churches. They, they were helping people in need. They were aggressive. They were active. Very aggressive, very active. And so in that work, as they are working, I am sure they're tempted. I am sure they're persecuted. But Jesus recognizes them. You have endured patiently. And you have not grown weary for the sake of my name. Who comes to mind in your life? Who comes to mind when you hear, when you hear that somebody who works, who, who toils, Somebody who just works to their exhaustion just all for the sake of the gospel. Like in your personal life, man, who come to mind? For me, it's my father. My, my father is somebody who, who is, is stubborn, who is uh, at times patient, but at times very determined. But man, when you step back and just kind of look at everything, it's all for the sake of the gospel. Man, he, he had quadruple bypass surgery um, a while back, and I, I kid you not, like seven days later, he's at midweek service, like preaching. Like, my, my dad's like, hey, you know, Jesus is going to take me. He's going to take me. You know, like that. Like he's, but he's going to work. You know, if you, if you tell him, Sifa, you need to Sabbath. I know it's biblical. You need, you need to rest. He goes, I'll rest in heaven. Like, that's, that, that's my kind of dad. We all know somebody like that. We do. We all know somebody like that. This is the type of church that they had. Full of people. That, that's who they were. They were determined. They worked hard. And Jesus recognized it. He saw them. Even in the midst of everything, he said, man, you are patient in endurance. The second thing he, he sees them doing is, man, they're faithful to his commands. He says, I know your works. And then later on, he says, how you cannot bear with those who are evil. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27, he, Paul says, tells the church, that neither give place to the devil. And they had it. They resisted evil. They resisted evil doers. Now, when you read this, you're like, well, Pete, you know, like, God hates the sin but loves the sinner. And so a lot of people say that, and, and I totally get it. But what do you do when you read verse, uh, Psalm 5, verse 5? That it, say, it says that, he hates evildoers. What do you do when you read the Old Testament and it says that Jacob I have loved, Esau, Esau I have hated? What do you do about that? Now, interesting enough, like let me clear this up. God does not like anyone that is intentionally doing evil. He does not like anyone that says, oh, that knows right and wrong, that sees everything Jesus, and then they're like, okay, I'm going to go this way. This is who he's talking about, people who are intentionally in sin, people who are intentionally going against God. That's who he is talking about. And he recognizes that the church is against them. They've resisted them. The other thing he recognizes them as, as, he's, as they are faithful to his commands, they're, they're saying, man, you guys have called out some, some fake apostles. It says in verse 2, it says, you have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. 
This, again, just shows just how, how this church was very, they had very sound doctrine in this church. They, they believed in the writings of the scripture. They promoted sound do- doctrine. They had a really great teaching ministry. They believed everything that they learned. They had a solid theology. Now, move down to verse 6. You see here it says in verse 6, it says, This you have. You hate the works of, of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So the, God, Jesus gives them uh, you know, props for also hating the Nicolaitans. Earlier in, my, in the first service, I said Nickelodeon. <laughs> I, was, I was going down that road to say, I'm like, you, you know, you're the works of Nickelodeon. And I'm like, no, it's not that. So yeah, I <laughs> yeah, thought it was funny. Um, the Nicolaitans, it's, it's interesting. Nobody kind of really knows, but a lot of people lean towards uh, uh, the Nicolaitans come from a guy named Nicholas. If you read Acts chapter 6, you see Nicholas is one of the deacons that were first called a deacon in Acts, in Acts chapter 6, and, and, and they say that Nicholas was a false believer that became a heretic, and, but he still retained influence in the church. And so what, what these Nicolaitans taught and what they followed was that you can take a little bit of Christianity, you can take a little bit of the world, and that will, that will create this, this, this combination of morality and success. Like you could be a Christian on Sunday, and then the rest of the time, you could be whatever you want, um, and then you, you'll be fine. Like they, they, they believed in the word, but not really, because they added things to the world, and they misconstrued things to fit who they were or how they felt that day. They twisted it. And so Jesus commanded them, like, man, like, you guys have done well for not, for not liking this group. I don't like their group. It reminds me of Acts chapter 20, verse 29 through 31. It says, I know that after my departure, this is Paul talking to the church in Ephesus. He's telling them, he says, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves are going to come. They're going to come among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, they will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Then he says this, therefore be alert. And so what by Jesus says here in Revelation, he says that they were doing just that. They were faithful in guarding the flock and keeping them safe from fierce wolves coming in and not sparing the flock. So here's the church in Ephesus. They are people that worked hard. They endured patiently. They were faithful. They, they kept the standard. They were obedient. They were passionate. However, verse 4. But this I have against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. But this I have against you, that you have abandoned the love you had first. That you have abandoned the love you had at first. Something changed. Something changed along the way. Like, I I don't know exactly what it was or what caused it. I have ideas, but here Jesus says, man, you have been doing the right things. You are doing the right things. You're working hard. You're in the middle of this sinful city. You are enduring through. You're focused on the, the task at hand. You have the correct theology, but you have abandoned your love for me. You have lost your love for me. Who you first loved, you no longer loved first. You see, I think the church in Ephesus had taken their things, their works. And they had taken it, it was supposed to be here, under Christ. They have taken it and placed it above Christ. And you and I, maybe, maybe from the outside, we, we see and be like, man, that church, wow. They got all sorts of things going on. You know, they're doing academy. They got BSF. They're, they're teaching all this stuff. Oh, my goodness. They, there are some things going on. But here we see that they were so fixated on those things so focused on those things that they forgot their first love. Last week, we saw a dead church, the Sardis church. They were a dead church, meaning they, they, were, they, were, they, they, they were comfortable, which led to them being complacent, which led to them being compromising. And so they were literally in their sin, and all they were doing was focus on themselves. This, this Ephesians church, this church in Ephesus, isn't dead. They had forgotten their first love. 
They weren't focused on Christ. They were focused on their works. It makes me think of our motivation for things. It makes me think of our motivation for, for, for being the church. Like if our motivation is duty, we say things, oh, I, I, I have to go to Bible study. Oh, I, I have to go to church on Sunday. Oh, I, I have to serve. Oh, I, I, I have to lead people in singing. Oh, I have to do sound. Oh, man, I have to tithe. You know, I have to be kind. I have to love my spouse. You know, like you, you, you say things like that, and, but that's, that's when a motivation is, is, is duty. But what if we thought of it was privilege? What, what, what if we, we, we saw it and understood everything that, and we did everything because of it's a privilege? Like, man, I get to go on Sundays. Man, I cannot wait till, till next Sunday. Can we hang out Monday? Can we hang out Tuesday? Like, man, I get to serve these little monsters, you know, and walkers. Like, I, man, I, like, could, could you imagine that? Could, could you imagine? It was like, man, I get to do sound so that people in our church get to sing to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Man, I get to stand out there and hold a stop sign for the safety of our families and the kids that get to church so they can learn more about Jesus Christ. Like, I get to do this? Oh, man, I, you, could you imagine the difference? There's, there's duty here. Oh, I have to. But then there's devotion. I get to. I remember I was struggling with just moving the two services. You know, after, after a while, I was like, man, like, you know, I was saying this, man, like, we have to go to two services. Like, we have to go to two services. We have to go to two services. And then, 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 uh, and then I don't know, somebody reminded me, it was like, no, we don't have to. We get to. And guys, and, and it's, it's, it's blowing up. God is like definitely blessing the local church here. And so it's, it, there, there's a difference. There's a duty and there is a devotion. I think Ephesus began in duty and began in devotion but as time went on fell into duty i think of our our kids you know we i was just reminded that we we we're only have up to 50 check-ins for our software that we use and we just got an email saying hey you've gone 3 weeks or 4 weeks um, going past your 50 check-ins you need to bump up to the next you know tier and it's just like, oh my goodness, like, we have a whole generation. We have a whole generation coming up, and they're, they're going to see us. They see us because one of the things I love about what we're doing here as multi-generational, multicultural, multi-everything is that we're doing everything together, and they're going to see us. They're going to see us do life together. They're going to see us do Bible studies together. They're going to see us here in academy. They're going to see us gathering. But man, if they say, why do you do that? And we're going to say, I don't know, just because I have to, just because I've been doing it. It's just because we've always been doing that. If we say that, we totally miss we rob our next generation of the purpose and the why. As we understand the why, we should be explaining alongside the how why we do what we do. That's what he says. We have a whole generation coming up. And when they ask things, why do you have elders? Why do you teach expository? Why do you do dinner with friends? Why, mommy and daddy, why do you give to the church? Why do you give to God? May we know our why. May they know our why so that our generation grows up in a God-fearing church, gospel-centered church. Jesus commends this church and they're faithful in their works, faithful in obeying his commands. And in verse 5 he says, Remember therefore where you have fallen, repent, do the works you did at first. And so after commending, after condemning, after, like, after those two things, he gives them a cure. He says three things. First, he says, remember. 
remember. And the, the literal original, it's mean, it means to keep on remembering. Like they, they had forgotten who they were. They had forgotten the, the, the position that they had, that they were sinners. They've forgotten who he was, the savior of the world, savior of their sins. They had forgotten that. They had forgotten that, they, that Jesus' blood had shed for their lives. They forgot that his body was being and, and being on, on the crucified on the cross. They had forgotten that he resurrected. They had forgotten all that. They had forgotten the purpose of the church. They had forgotten all that. So Jesus hears, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Second thing he tells him, he says, repent. He repent. Well, repent from what? Right? Re- repent from what? It doesn't seem like a big deal. Well, it is. Losing your first love for Christ, that's a sin. That is a sin. Now, the difference from last week's church is they, they were openly in sin. Here, it's so easy. Come on, man. Like, how many of us here have started off walking with Christ and it was devotion, right? It was like, oh, man, doing all this. Stuff. And then by the time before you know it, it falls into duty. Man, it just happens. I think that's what's happened here at Ephesus. And so he says, repent. Repent. Get on your knees. Pray. Confess. And ask for forgiveness. And then the third, third thing he does is do the works you did at first. He tells them to Return. Return to being devoted to to his word because of your love for Christ. Return to breaking bread with each other because of your love for Christ. Return to fellowshipping with one another because of your love for Christ. Return to praying for one another because of your love for Christ. Return to serving one another because of your love for Christ. Return to meeting each other's needs because of your love for Christ. Return to that. Go back to that. And he said, so he simply put, put, remember, repent, repent. Return. Remember from where you've fallen. Repent your sins. Confess and turn. And return back to doing what you're doing because of the love of Christ. And then he says in verse 5, the last part of verse 5, he says, If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place Unless you repent. Some translations put or else. And you read this and you're like, if not, or, or else, I will come to you. He's not talking about a second coming. Nah, he, he says, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. What he's talking about is removing away your lampstand. Remember, the, 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 the church in Ephesus is this great church. They have this great ministry. Everything, people are, 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 are understanding, you know, just knowledge and have this great doctrine. But he says, if, if you do not change, if you do not repent, you are going to have nothing. You are going to be nothing. I am going to come and it's over. I'm going to remove your lampstand. Remember what the lampstand re, uh, represents in chapter 1? The lampstand is the church. So is Jesus saying what I think he's saying? That he is going to take away the church? That the church will be gone? The church will be terminated? Yeah. Verse 7. He says... He who has an ear, let him hear the, what the Spirit says to the churches. This is the message meant for Ephesus, but as we go through it today, it's very evident it's also meant for us today. And so it would be wise if we as individuals, but holistically as a community, as a church, that we would learn from this. And the last part of verse 7, it says, To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Christ gives the church a promise. He said, those who who overcome this, those who endure, those who who push through, those who finish the race, they they, they would eat of this tree. 
This tree of life is, in Genesis is mentioned in chapter 3, and it's also mentioned later on in Revelation chapter 22. It's this, this, this fruit of life, and you, if you eat of it, you'll never die because you'll be in paradise with God, which is heaven. And so there's this encouragement at the end to be reminded of the benefits of what will occur in the future, of, of God's gracious provision for, for salvation at that very moment. Remember, 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 but then also eternity, what is to come. And this is the letter of, of Jesus Christ to Ephesus. So my question for us here today, what is the most important to you in your life? What is the most important to you in your life? Is it Jesus? Or is it the idea or the things, the benefits of Jesus? The benefits of, oh, I get to do community with one another. That you love community more than Jesus. What is more important to you in your life? If you're a believer here tonight, or today, and you just kind of find yourself like, man, the light's been dim a little bit. Man, I'm just, the zeal's not there. If you're a believer, I want to encourage you to remember, repent, and return. Just as Christ uh, told the church in Ephesus, that is going to be the same, and it's enough for us we don't need any other application. We, need, we don't need any other challenge. But if, if you're a believer of Jesus Christ and you find yourself like, man, Pete, Jesus has not been number one in my life. I get it. I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. And so like, remember, remember what he has done. Re- uh, repent and return. Repent and return. Remember, repent, return. And so this next week, you don't, you don't start things like, oh, man, I, I got to do this. No, you start with like, man, I, I, I get to love my coworker who hates Jesus. Like, oh, man, I, 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 get, to, I get to go home and, and love my kids. Man, oh, man, I, I get to go to work. Like, oh, man, like just like that kind of stuff. Everything changes. So remember, repent and return. Let the love of Christ drive whatever it is that you do. Last night, we're at a home for dinner and a friend, dinner with friends. And uh, the, the host, uh, he, he's a nurse. And uh, man, it was, uh, I loved being there. Amazing time, amazing guy. And he's just sitting there, and, and one of the other guests, they're a nurse as well. And, and you know, be like, hey, what, what kind of nurse are you? And, and he was like, well, you know, I'm, I'm a nurse here. And, and I don't know exactly the name of the location where he's a nurse, but I do know this that the people that he, he oh, that he, the clients, the people that are there are, are on the rough edges. They're, they're, they're mentally, you know, like challenged and like hardcore people. And, and so, and one of the nurse, the other nurses say, hey, so do you like it there? You, and you could tell, like, and he was like, no, I, I, I don't like it. I love it. And then the rest of the night, he, he goes on, and, and it's, just, it's just, you can tell when he talked about his job and what he did for work and who he got to talk with, when he talked about that, he lit up. Like, it's almost like he sat up out of his chair, and he was like, Pete, man, like, man, it's so good. Like, I'm, like you know, we went to Rome in, in December, and, and we're just, you know, the Vatican and all that, but man, but Jesus, man, like, Jesus is like, he was like, I feel it, like, I own it, like, it's my faith. And he was like, at work, like, I tell people, like, it just, it just comes out, and I, I tell people about Jesus, and it's just, and it's, you can see, like, him lighting up, and it's all because of his love, his first love for Jesus, and so in the, in the moment where, in the time where he is in this place where people are, are just very challenged and stuff, he tells people about Jesus. And he said last night, he was like, man, there was, there was a time where I, I told him, like, dude, like, you know, Jesus, you need to get connected to the church. And he told us that that, that person's demeanor and everything just changed. Like, he even told him, it was like, you know, he told him, hey, you need to get connected to the church. He was like, man, like, I got nowhere to go. Like, I'm homeless. He was like, I, I don't care. Be homeless next to a church. Like, 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 that's how the zeal behind him. And I'm like, yes, that's it. That's it. Imagine if we were all that way. The truth is, is we're not. But that's why we have community. That's why we have each other. So that we can encourage. We can spur on. We can pray for one another. Could you imagine us 
doing that. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, take, take this next song as we sing. Ask God to guide you to be his light in your world. Remember, repent, and return. If you're not a believer, guys, I, I want to encourage you. I want you to know that you are a sinner. But just like all of us, you are a sinner, I am a sinner. And if you, if you don't understand the gospel, I, I hope you heard it today. I, I want you to know that as a sinner, you are in need of a Savior. Somebody to save your soul. That somebody to, that, that would pay the price of your sins. Somebody that, that would do that for you. And I want you to know that nobody here, nobody here could do it for you. I want you to know that there's nothing you can ever do that would ever be enough that would pay your sin. It's only Jesus Christ that could do that. And so if you are not a believer or maybe you have been around church for, for a while and you're just like, oh, it makes sense. Like, I totally understand the gospel. If that's you, maybe, like, great. Don't feel embarrassed about anything. No. If you're embarrassed about Pete, you don't know what I've done. I say, I don't. But I do know what he's done. And it will pay for anything you have done. Anything. There's nothing you can do that he will say, oh, never mind, my, the cross and death, burial, and resurrection is not for you. No, there's nothing you could ever do that he would say that to you. Place your faith in Jesus Christ. He is your Savior. He has a life promise for you that is full. It's just going to cost you your life. And just to be honest, it's not all roses and peaches and all that. Life is still hard. But the difference is, is now that we have a hope in Jesus Christ. That's the difference. Let's pray.